So if you don't know him already, he hails from Oklahoma and studied at Northeastern State University, and his photographs have appeared in National Geographic, Life, Time, Newsweek, you name it. And he is the author of, a co-author of the book, We Were There, Voices of African American Veterans, published in 2004 by HarperCollins. And his fine art photography has won him grants from the NEA, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and Indi the Independence Foundation, to name a few. And I'm sure you'd rather hear his lecture than a, a longer list of his accomplishments, but I will add that I really feel fortunate to work and to co-curate with such an erudite and easygoing colleague. So I give you the most wonderful Ron Tarver.
people are positioned in this um, in this frame. I mean, there are so many pictures within this picture. Um, where's my pointer? I had, a, I had all this stuff set up anyway. But there's um, you can look and frame off several different photographs within this picture. It, it's just an amazing image, and, and the, the depth, the weight, the balance of it. It's just it's just a wonderful picture. Um, but his work really, really changed throughout, through, throughout the years, especially uh, over the course of uh, his studies with Lizette. Um, one of his influences was um, W. Gene Smith, who was one of my influences. I mean, I bow to this picture. I mean, when I was in high school, uh, W. Gene Smith, I dreamed about this man. He was just an amazing, amazing photographer. Um, he uh, photographed uh, for Life magazine as well as a lot of the other magazines back in the 40s and 50s. Fo did a lot of uh, war uh, 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 photography. Uh, sort of the inventor of documentary photography as we know it. Um, and uh, spawned all sorts of photographers and, and inspired all sorts of photographers to do photo stories. When I came to the Philadelphia Inquirer, I, that's all I wanted to do was do photo stories. And uh, for a while there, that's that is what I did for a long time, um, outside of my general assignment pictures. But um, I really concentrated on uh, on documentary photography based on the ideas that W. D. Smith had put forward. Um, this is called Walk Through Paradise Garden. This is grand grandchildren walking down a path into uh, into their garden. Um, and I show this because I want to show a couple of Im images that uh, maybe aren't didactic of these images that Bruce made, but uh, you, there, there's the spirit of what these of of, uh, of, of his influences in, in his work, and as we move forward, you'll I think you'll be able to see that. Um, and I compare it to this one. Um, the spirit of that is there. Um, you know, I tell my students if if I haven't told them already, but my I'm teaching photo one this year, so we're doing a film class. Um, we don't have a dark room, but they process the film and um, and then scan it. So this is our second year, or second year, feels like second year, second, second week uh, process. <laughs> no offense to you guys, you're great. Uh, <laughs> but you know, there's always those things like, the cam there's, we always go through the camera doesn't work, there's blank film, somebody's film doesn't come out, it always happens. It's not your fault, it's just the way it is. But uh, uh, one of the things that I hope you guys get out of this is a pre an appreciation for uh, how photographers stand on the backs of each other. You know, there's, there's, it's a myth to think that you just come out of the womb and you have an original idea. You know, <coughs> maybe, I've never done that, but uh, maybe some people do. But um, I think the really, the photographers that have, have, have sort of made their state have looked back and seen what has happened before. And I think, uh, you know, this picture may not be the exact same thing, but I think the DNA of that Walk Through Paradise Garden is there. Uh, another picture is this one of um, uh, a wounded and dying infant that was found by an American soldier in, 19, uh, in Saipan in 1944, uh, taken by uh, W. Gene Smith. Uh, you know, I think, you know, when I saw the picture that's going to come next, this picture came to my mind because it just shows the grace that that W. Gene Smith had in in, in, in in instilling in his work, um, and I compare it to this one. Um, I think this picture is just really, really um, a nice, very nice, very nice picture. And the way he framed it, um, it, it shows that grace and compassion for for uh, the subject. Uh, another one of his influences was uh, Diane Arbus, who also studied with Lizette. Um, she, uh, they both used twin lens. Uh, 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 Twin, twin lens uh, cameras that shoot a square format, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I found after sort of um, you know doing a little research about uh, how uh, Lizette, which Lizette told her students, was to uh, uh, get close to the subject. Um, and uh, this is a picture of, of, of uh, Jermaine Greer, taken in 1977 by uh, Diane Arbus. Uh, to use all of the frame. I mean, you, you know, I have to think that this frame is real estate and it's very valuable. It's a two and a quarter inch square and you should utilize it uh, to its best benefit. Um, found, uh, I think I may have mentioned this panel discussion I found about Lizette. 
Uh, so I'm going, to I'm going to refer back to that. Uh, it was a panel discussion of several of the photographers that she trained uh, that, uh, that uh, had some, uh, reminisce, uh, some uh, thoughts about her work. Uh, but one of the things that uh, um, she said to Rosalind, uh, uh, Rosalind uh, uh, Solomon um, was that uh, she had, Lizette had been criticized for, for uh, going too close in her work. And uh, she said that, so she went, she had a talk with Edward Steichen, who she had become friends with, and Edward told her uh, to uh, go closer. There's only three uh, close-up photographers in the world. So um, I think, uh, I think uh, Diane took it to heart. Um, but then you have this picture of Bruce's um, that shows that he really took it to heart. Um, this is called Val's Eye. I don't know if anybody knows her, but uh, I think she was one of his friends in New York. This was taken in 1971. And uh, his mother, Jane. So you can really see the influences that, that, uh, that um, Lizette had. This is a picture of Lizette um, uh, not too long before she passed away. Um, she came to the U.S. In, uh, in the 20s. She studied. She originally wanted to be a, uh, a singer. She studied with uh, Arnold Schoenberg. Um, but she had a problem with her voice, which sort of altered her plans. Um, I found a French uh, journal, uh, and you're going to have to excuse my Oklahoma accent because French in Oklahoma does not work very well. But, uh, it's Jour de Plume um, that uh, said that she was largely self-taught. Uh, around 1939, she began taking a, a photography lessons with, uh, with her uh, friend uh, Roger uh, um, Andre, who was the first wife of Andre Cortez, um, and sort of credits her as what, probably her only real photo lesson. Um, she said uh, that the, what she took away from studying with her, what Lizette took away, was never photograph anything you're not passionate in. And uh, that's another thing that I'd like to instill in my students, you know, don't photograph something unless you really, really believe in what you're doing, because it can get really, first of all, it can get really boring really fast. And uh, it, it makes what you photograph even more important. And that work, that importance, will transcend the, the, the photograph. Um, she developed a highly personal style, uh, very direct but, but a respectful to her subjects. Um, when she arrived in 1938 in uh, New York City, she was really she was really taken by the city, by the by the, the, the energy of the, 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 of the city. Um, yeah. She was, before she came to, to the, the U.S., uh, she made a series of portraits on the prom, in, in Nice, uh, 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 on the promenade d'Anglaise uh, in 1934. Um, and these portraits caught the eye of Ralph, uh, Ralph Steiner, who was the editor of PM's Weekly. It was a, a New York City liberal, liberal leaning newspaper. And he published these, these the series of images. And what these images capture was sort of the bourgeois class of, of, uh, of uh, France at the time. And uh, I don't think that the, uh, it, he ran the photos with, with a, a title that, that really ticked off the French government. So he's got uh, in a little bit of trouble with this. And actually, the McCarthy government, uh, the McCarthy uh, Senator McCarthy investigated her for um, the, uh, to be, you know, the communist activity. Um, so she sort of got on that list. Um, Larry Fink, a professor, professor of photography at Bard College, who studied uh, with Lizette, um, said of her work that um, she was an advocate for, advocate for the truth, uh, compassionate without judgment. Uh, she, her pe the people in her images are just who they are. They don't pretend to be anybody else. Um, she, uh, what she instilled in all of her students was, was to look for the freshness of the moment and that uh, even though you can talk about art in these very sophisticated terms, uh, at the end, the most important you can do is, is dissolve yourself in the moment and become organic with, with what is in front of you. In other words, just become what is in front of you. I mean, you actually have to, you have to be that thing and understand what that thing is that you're photographing, be it still life, human, animal, whatever, you have, really have to kind of grasp that thing and, and uh, to, photograph it, to photograph it. <coughs> Alexei uh, Brodovich, who was an art editor at a Harper, at a Harper, at a Harper uh, Harper's Bazaar, uh, 
letter to uh, commission this first image. It's called Coney Island Bather. And this is probably, I don't know if anybody's seen this image, but this is what I think of when I think of uh, Lizette Bordeaux. This is probably her signature image. Um, I think the image speaks to the unflinching manner in which the way she photographed her subjects. I mean, they're very unapologetic. Um, this woman is who she is, and she doesn't make any pre pretense about being anybody else. Um, the way she filled the frame uh, is really important. There's no wasted space in this frame. Even the wave between her legs has a significant significance. Um, everything about this, the composition of this, is perfect. Um, and her images have this strong sense of humanity. Uh, uh, Bernice Abbott, um, who was probably around just about as long as anybody in photography, uh, uh, said about her work, what is, uh, what is occasionally referred to as uh, Modell's fat woman is misleading. What she means to say is this person is vital and strong, <coughs> be it thin, fat or thin. This woman is who she is. Um, she created a series of, uh, when, she, when she got to New York, she created a series of works um, uh, that I think will see greatly influence Bruce's work. Um, she did uh, several series. One was Pedestrians. Uh, this is around 1945. They basically just observed men and women on the street, um, just doing their thing. Um, she did a, a, a series uh, in a bar in the Lower Side, uh, I, believe, I believe the Lower East End, called Sammy's Bar. Uh, where she observed people and demonstrated uh, how you know the relationships between these people. Um, one of the interesting things about this whole series, and actually, I have a book here um, that you're welcome to uh, to see. Maybe we can put it out in the gallery. Uh, it's Lizette Modell, and you can see some of her other images in here. Uh, but what it, like I said, what it demonstrates is is is, is uh, just people's relationships to one another. Um, what's also really interesting is how she used the frame again. You have these, these, in, these uh, uh, gestures that come from the edge of the frame, the hand up at the top, the woman with the cigarette on the right hand side, the way that it's <coughs> tilted, all add tension and, and a dynamic uh, to, the, to the image that probably wouldn't be there if she just, she just struck, shot it straight on. And, and uh, the lighting is really important too. Her lighting was exquisite. Um, really informed Larry Fink's work, if you uh, know his work. Larry uses very direct lighting, very strobe, uh, direct strobe in his images. Uh, relies really heavily on, on the uh, highlights and shadows. Um, and uh, again, you, you see in Larry's work sort of the DNA of, of uh, Lizette uh, in, 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 his, in his pictures. Um, this picture, and this is where I really need my corner, and I don't know what happened to it. Oh well. So. I'll point. Uh, Larry, uh, uh, this is also one of her most famous images, it's called Fashion Show, uh, taken in 1957. Um, Bruce introduced uh, Gary Schneider, who was a, a photographer and printer at the time. Uh, Bruce, when he was director of the Marlboro Ga Gallery, introduced Gary Schneider to Lizette, who became Lizette's printer. And uh, in the, the, uh, the panel discussion online, Gary uh, talks about how he printed this image. Lizette was very, very demanding on how her prints were made. Um, and uh, he talked about how Lizette wanted both faces. Both faces had to be of equal value. And uh, if you know anything about printing in the dark room, sometimes that's kind of a tall order. I mean, to get everything correct and to get the highlights here, the reflections here on the, sh on the um, the rim of the glass to get the milk white actually over here was you know kind of a, it was it was this was not an easy print to make plus it's, it's high key it's high contrast so to get the blacks blacks the whites right the mid, mid tones right uh, he also was introduced to potassium ferrocyanide that if you, if, you, if you have ever been in the dark room know that it will kill you but it's also magical stuff it also <laughs> lets, uh, you know I should have been dead a long time ago but uh, the uh, potassium for a sign would reduce tones, but it would also give you contrast in, in, uh, in areas where you needed it. Um, so he was interested, this, this print he worked on for days and days and days before he got it right. Um, uh, another one of uh, one of Lisa's, uh, uh, Lisette's, uh, 
uh, uh, series was Reflections, and she worked on this series from 1939 to 1945, focused on shop windows and people reflected in, uh, in, in, in shop windows in New York. Um, you know, so if you look at these images, you think, well, they're reflections, but they also, there's this surreal quality to them. I mean, they, they really harken back to uh, surrealism, uh, maybe some impressionism. There's a lot going on. These are very, very complex images when you, when you sort of dissect them. Um, another one. Beautiful images. Uh, she did a series of people walking in New York. She called it uh, Running Legs. Uh, she did this between 1940 and 1941, uh, where she had to get down at a low angle to make these obvious, she had to get down at a low angle. So imagine this woman laying down in the street, that's what it took, and making these images as people walk by, and there are dozens of them. Um, so, you know, I think it demonstrates that, again, she said you should not be afraid to make images, you know. Conversely, you should be afraid to make images, because by pushing yourself to make those images that you're afraid of, you're going to make good images. Um, so uh, I think this really demonstrates that. And one of the things, too, that I want to stress to you know, my students is that you know, don't shoot from five foot in the air, or four foot in the air, or where, however tall you are, because that looks normal. Get down, get up, move to the side, move around. Photography is a very physical thing. It's not just, you know, it's not a spectator sport. I mean, you really have to be involved in, in, when, when you're making your images. Um, you know, and these images, too, are a little bit different than her other images because her other, her other images are so direct. Uh, these are more ly lyrical, they're a little bit more playful. Um, you know, they show, they show movement. A, a lot of her, image, her uh, uh, portraitures are, 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 are very static. Um, I found this online. Sorry, it's a little pixelated, but I just love this idea of of, uh, of how you got to Lizette. Uh, there were two ways you could study with her. Um, from 1951, uh, Bruce took lessons from uh, uh, before Bruce took lessons from Lizette. Um, she worked at the uh, at the New School uh, for Social Research, um, and then she started to uh, offer private lessons. And so on the left, you have the official uh, new, uh, new School Bulletin uh, with, uh, you can't read it there, but it has her course description in there. And then on the right, you have a handwritten note that you would just tack up on the wall somewhere. And that's the way people got to her if you wanted a private lesson, uh, which I thought was really sweet because, uh, uh, you know, here you have this world famous photographer and uh, she's writing a note and putting it on the wall somewhere. Um, Bruce wrote uh, a really nice letter to his parents about Lizette uh, and his first encounter with her during class. And he said, I'm very excited about taking lessons with Lizette, which starts this Monday. I've never felt more confident about any previous sort of formal schooling. This is absolutely the right direction for me, uh, for me to be doing now. And I can envision my, with my relationship <coughs> with the teacher and the class and what we're all doing to be quite involved involving rather, rather, rather like a good seminar at Swarthmore. Um, so, yay. Um, she and I liked and understood each other right off, right off and uh, it pleased me that she understood and liked my photographs. When I packed up my pictures uh, after showing them, um, uh, she said that she wished all of her students would be as sensitive as I am, but then doubted it and then added that you will add sensitivity to them. Um, a little bit about um, Bruce's technique and, and what he used. Um, uh, in his words, and I think it may have been in this, no, it wasn't in this letter, it was some, someplace else that, I, that he uh, talked about the camera that he used. He used a beat up 1950s Rolleiflex twin lens, re, uh, twin lens camera. And I brought one here. This is what it looks like if you want to see it later. Um, it's a very, very difficult camera to photograph, to frame because it's square. The square format is, is not, it's very unforgiving. It's not as if you're photographing in a rectangle because with the rectangle, we all see our vision is rectangular. With this camera, it's used only in a square. So it doesn't really allow for anything to come into the edges of the frame. Everything is pretty much directed towards the center. Um, 
He printed on Agfa uh, Padriga Rapid paper, which uh, became defunct in 1982. Uh, and this paper is revered. It's, it's a very, very beautiful paper to print on. And in fact, I Googled to see uh, if there's any out there. And pe it sells for crazy amounts in, uh, on eBay. So I ran down to my dark room, and I found some. So if anybody wants to buy it, here it is. It's the worst pack. I have it. Um, I have 8 by 10. Uh, but I printed on this stuff. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, uh, it's an amazing paper. Amazing paper. It, it gives you these uh, warm tone, um, very, uh, it's a warm tone black paper. You'll see the quality of the paper in, in, uh, in Bruce's uh, work down there. It's just a beautiful, beautiful paper. Creamy uh, whites, uh, silky, warm tone blacks. Um, one of the things that Bruce did that Gus Cutts told me was that he didn't use a ne negative carrier. And if you, any of you are familiar with the darkroom, when you put your negative into the uh, enlarger, it usually goes into a negative carrier, which holds the negative flat. But Bruce didn't do that. He did. He, for some reason, he didn't like printing with the uh, with the negative carrier. So you'll notice that some of the images may not be square around the edges. They're a little off, and that's because the negative isn't flat when you put it in the, in the, um, in the negative carrier. Um, this is a picture of uh, Sarah Morflin, uh, who became uh, his, uh, uh, the artistic executor, executor to his estate. Uh, this poster <coughs> was taken in 1992. Um, uh, Sarah and I had a really long talk about Bruce, and I wish I could put everything in that she said about him, but. Uh, she, she had nothing but good things to say. Um, they had a professional relationship, but it was also a friendly relationship. They, they, were, they were true friends. Um, she told me that Bruce came to the city to explore his art and be closer to the gay community. Uh, you know, where he found a circle of friends there that he could, uh, where he could be himself. Uh, she talked about how AIDS had, had really devastated the photographic community. All of a sudden, young men were just dying. Uh, and, you know, it, back then nobody knew what AIDS was all about. Um, uh, when uh, people showed Bruce's work, uh, it, 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 when I say people, when people, when galleries showed Bruce's work, it was mostly still lifes because it was very difficult. But you have to, the, the, the New York gallery scene uh, back then was still emerging. It was a very, very young uh, business. And uh, gallery owners were still trying to figure out like what was going to sell. Um, so, you know, the, you see the gay, the gay um, Craig work that Bruce did, a lot of his portraiture work, um, of which is, is, is vast. I mean, he, had, he has lots and lots of uh, portraits. None of that would sell. So, what was most interesting and what <coughs> what sold in the galleries was his uh, was his still lifes. Um, she also said that, um, she talked about the way that Bruce held the camera, and she said he held it like he was cradling a bird. Uh, she said he had beautiful hands. He nested the camera into his torso, um, and Sarah described it as a balletic action. Um, when he would advance the film, and, and these cameras can be sort of loud when you advance it. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it because there's no film in here, but you actually wind it. And it, it, it can sound as if you're, you know, winding a, a washing machine because there's a big mirror in here that flops up. So, but he had this this way where he, he would wind it very smooth, and she said it all it sounded almost harmonious in the way that he advanced the film, uh, and it's, it's so it wouldn't uh, alarm or disturb his, his subjects. Um, and again, like I said, the, his portraiture was very, very important to him, uh, according to Sarah, and that. Um, he uh, photographed his friends. He had a very wide circle of friends in New York. Um, he photographed him in his, in his home uh, on the, uh, was it on the Upper East Side or 34th? Yeah. Okay. Um, he had to call Che uh, um, Moi. Moi? Moi. Moi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> che Moi. Uh, uh, evidently, uh, when you walked up the stairs, uh, it was just a, a, a place to behold. It was really, really beautiful. This is Elsa Dorfman. 
I think in 1989. Um, David, that we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, people from the um, Gay Pride Parade. Um, she talked about how his work is imbued with life, and I think you can see that. I don't think anybody needs to, to tell you that. Uh, some of his, his work, was the, the light is reminiscent of Dutch paintings. Um, she said that he would go to flea markets and pick out items to photograph, and his apartment was just full of beautiful objects, uh, that he really loved beautiful things. Uh, she said he wouldn't so much arrange an ob a, a, a still life, but observe it and uh, observe the way that the light reflected off the uh, off silver or off glass. Um, this is a really bad reproduction of the, the, the uh, actual images inside. But uh, when he, when he worked for um, Sotheby's uh, for a while, and he was um, sort of their silver expert, so he bought silver uh, for them. Uh, he went overseas and, and, and worked for a while in Houston. Uh, so he was able to, to uh, understand what the, the quality of, of uh, silver was and, and appreciate that through his photographs. Um, his photographs are very delicate and sensitive. Everybody that I've talked to said that about his photographs. They have a certain, you know, and in art this can be um, sort of a derogatory thing, but they have a certain sweetness to them. They have a certain amount of uh, uh, sentimentality. Uh, and I think in his, the way that he photographed, that's okay, because his work, he, his work is who he was. Uh, Yancy Richardson, owner of Yancy Richardson Gallery in Chelsea, uh, now she's in Chelsea. Uh, this was a photograph of her in 1990, uh, 1996 uh, during her 40th birthday party. Um, and I've, I have fantasized about being in Yancy Richardson's gallery. This is a, this is a disclosure. <laughs> she, her gallery is probably one of the best galleries in New York as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's, it's really great. And then to have a conversation with her about Bruce was, uh, it was, it was one of my life's dreams, so I, I'm done now, so I can go home. Um, she met him at the, at the Whitney Gallery when he was working at the Whitney Gallery, gallery when, he, uh, when she was 20. Uh, he was, he was uh, older than she was. And, <laughs> It's, it's funny because now Yancey is who she is, I and mean, she has this well-established gallery. And uh, she went to Bruce. She was uh, consult doing consulting work at the time and, and a little collecting. She didn't have a gallery then. She went to Bruce um, to seek some advice, and she said Bruce kind of blew her off. <laughs> I'm like, what? You blew off Yancey Richards, and that's crazy. But um, so <laughs> they became really good friends. Um, she remember, remembers him as erudite, uh, generous, and charming. He was uh, in a, an impeccable dresser, uh, gave his work to his friends uh, when he made photographs. Uh, he loved beautiful things. Um, she said walking up to his apartment, uh, you, it, the furniture was covered in velvet. She said it was very Victorian. She said it was everything was just impe impeccably uh, decorated. This is an amazing place just to be, let alone photograph. Um, and uh, she said, uh, throughout the year, she had a, a following of, of people that um, that were discovering photography uh, as a collectible item. Like, you know, like I said before, uh, galleries in New York hadn't really been established yet uh, to the extent they are now. So to build that audience of work took some doing, and Bruce was able to develop that audience uh, uh, and, and s sustain his work as a collect collectible object. Um, I, you know, I said, so was Bruce, uh, was he one of the top-notch photographers? And she said, well, no, I mean, he wasn't like a Robert Maplethorpe. I mean, at the time, Maplethorpe was probably about, <coughs> and still is, one of the best-known photographers, you know, on the planet. Uh, but she said Bruce wasn't to that level, but he did have this following of people that were, um, that were really eager to collect his work. Uh, one of my favorite <coughs> this is Brooklyn. Bridge uh, centennial picture. Uh, that again is a very sentimental image, um, but it's uh, it has this magical quality to it. And I think if you look at a lot of Bruce's works, they do have sort of this magical sort of transcendent quality to it. It's also the way that he printed. Um, I would imagine if you saw this negative, it probably did not look that way. But it's the way that Bruce manipulated the uh, the negative to um, to make the, the to to 
through a dark in the lower parts. Um, all the information on there is blocked out. We don't need to see that. That's dark in the sky and enhance the, uh, I'm going to fall over, and enhance the, uh, I'm sure there's a big cord down here, uh, and enhance the uh, fireworks. Uh, so it's just, it's just a beautiful image and the way the bridge sort of disappears into the smoke. I mean, there's, there's so much about this picture that is, is just wonderful. Uh, um, again, you know, this, the DNA of Lizette, uh, uh, reflections that he uh, that he photographed, and then we, there are several uh, in the uh, in the works down there that you'll see. Um, again, they're not derivative of uh, Lizette's work, but they show that spirit of her work uh, uh, in these reflection images. Um, like I said before, he would collect things. He would go to uh, to uh, flea markets and collect things. I'm not sure about the uh, exact origin of the, the person that's cut out, but I think he would. Uh, find images, find old photographs, and, and just sort of make, you know, manipulate them in some way that made an interesting image and arrange them in, uh, in, his, in his apartment. Um, Yancey said that he didn't so much work in series, but he collected images. So he just walked around with his cameras and he photographed what he saw. He photographed what he thought was interesting, um, which, you know, ain't a bad way to work because Sometimes I think that, you know, what the gallery system does is it sort of forces you to think in a certain way, and it really can pigeonhole you uh, as, a, as an artist uh, to do a certain thing. And some people are happy with that, and, uh, you know, uh, and I, I guess suppose it works for other people, but I think uh, it really limits what is seen of your work. Uh, and, I, and I don't think Bruce really cared too much about that. I think Bruce photographed what he liked, he photographed what he saw, and he made the images that, it, that, that appealed to him. Um, he had a keen eye and awareness, awareness of the moment. I think he waited for things to happen. Photography, uh, for the most part, is about waiting. You know, everybody thinks that you want to run out and to take the button, and now you have, you know, a 64 gig card, and put it in the camera, and I can take a million pictures, and I can edit off all down to one. I mean, that's not what photography is about. Photography is about waiting. It's about waiting for that moment. It's waiting for that that object to walk, to that person to walk into the light. It's about just letting things evolve and roll out over time. And I think Bruce had that a really keen sense of pre-visualization pre uh, to make these things happen. Uh, you can read all kinds of things into this. This is a reflection, uh, obviously, to, um, you know, to people, uh, but also shot, uh, you know, either through a glass or reflected in a glass, but, uh, but uh, evokes all sorts of, uh, of uh, mythical sort of ideas about what's going on there. Um, he, uh, again, was a master of light and shadow and uh, knew how to make things happen in that light and how to manipulate those shadows to make really, really compelling images. Uh, you might see a little bit of this, uh, again, that DNA of Lizette uh, in, uh, in these images from her um, people walking images. Um, this is a part of uh, a series of David in bed, and we have uh, the, the, the series of David down there. Uh, David was a partner for 10 years, and he died of AIDS. Um, I think this might be the first time these images have been exhibited. Uh, so it's it's a real it's a treat to see this collection of images and how um, and, and and you know what it meant to not only what David meant, but what these images mean. Uh, in terms of the history of, of AIDS and, uh, and, and how they sort of fit into that. There's also a series of, uh, of, uh, from the Gay Pride Parade uh, that um, you'll see. Um, and, you know, you look at these, the, the Gay Pride images now and you think, well, you know, they're just, you know, I mean, I mean, we've all seen those images, but at the time Bruce was photographing these, not many people were doing it in the way that Bruce did it. And, uh, uh, I think now that we now that this archive is here, the images are even more important now. Um, and uh, the final image I have is uh, this one's not included in the in, in the exhibit, but it's, it's certainly one of my favorite images. And uh, it, it 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 goes back to a quote that uh, Bruce uh, said. He said, "Often I photograph the unseen, things that are not there, sensations and memories. Uh, there's a presence in the absence." My camera work is, is alchemical. 
uh, creating a visual poetry of heart, idea, and spirit. So with that, I'll, uh, if anybody has any questions or answers, I'll... Uh, That's another. I can. We need to have a beer about that one because it's it's vast. It's completely changed the way that people think about photography digital has. So. Come on. Um, I'm curious about the comment you said about Yancey Richardson talking, or actually comparing um, Bruce to Maplethorpe, mm -hmm. and you know I can see where that comes from because they're both gay. Right. But aside from that, is there really, I mean, photography of flowers and gorgeous still lives, but in terms of, as gay artists, they seem so many miles apart. You know, but I wonder if the comparison is unfair. There's a, there's a lot of images that aren't here that I think probably, you're right, I mean, they don't compare, but I think that there are images that probably compare more than what we have here. Um, you know, I mean, Maplethorpe was doing all kinds of things, you know, and uh, he was doing, I mean, I think, for one thing, the way Maplethorpe used light, because a lot of his light was artificial light, it was strobe light. He wasn't using um, uh, available light. I think for the most part, Bruce was using available light. So that gives a whole different sort of sharpness or unsharpness of the image, depending on what the light is. You know, and Maplethorpe was very graphic in, in, in what he did. Bruce had some pretty pretty graphic nudes um, that um, that are that are not seen. So it depends on how you're comparing these things. You know, if you're comparing them to to the graphic quality, if you're comparing them to the print quality, um, I think it's it's you know it's all up for your own opinion. Chris came to Philadelphia to see the famous Maplethorpe exhibition yeah, yeah. and was very interested in it. Um, but I, I feel as if I learned a lot about his career from your talk just now. Oh, thank you. printed everything on this paper <laughs> for Trigger Rapid. Go on, bids are going. He printed everything on Trigger Rapid as far as I know and according to us. So, um, and I mean this was the paper at the time. There wasn't a better paper. Well, it depended on what you wanted. I mean there was Trigger Rapid, there was Code of Roma, there were all these different papers out there. Depending on the, what you wanted in, in your image. But you know, Bruce obviously wanted that nice, creamy, sort of smooth, silky look. And, and Patricia Rabbit, uh, Patricia, yeah, Patricia Rabbit uh, did that. So. Well, I was going to say something um, on behalf of our family. Um, I'm John Krause, Bruce's older brother, and I see some familiar faces from our long, long uh, association with Swarthmore over the years since my father arrived here in 1950. Um, and both Bruce and I are graduates. Um, and I wanted to particularly thank uh, Andrea and Ron and Felicity 
Valley. It's remarkable. So you may have seen it, and I hope all of you will take a moment to come and see it either right now or in a couple of days. I want to say something to the students who are here about Bruce's, um, a part of Bruce's life that I think is really important for those who are aspiring photographers. And that is that in addition to all of this work that you'll see in the exhibit and that, that, that Ron has talked about, um, of course, the, the struggle to create a photographic career, he was deeply devoted to his family. And there's lots and lots of photography that we didn't even show him. There's family over there. It's family. <coughs> it's just a wedding, a graduation, a, a vacation. Uh, he was, and, and I think that's important when you're uh, uh, an aspiring photographer to also be part of your family and record your family. And it's so important to us now that he had that other dimension. He was completely family oriented. Um, he did have three partners over his life. All of them were part of our lives. All of them.